got two, two stories we're going to look at that I think are kind of cool, but we'll get your opinion as we go on here. We are winding down the kingdom, the northern kingdom, and we've talked about the, the book of Kings primarily pulls in the northern kingdom with Elijah, Elijah, and their ministries and <clears throat> all these different kings that were ruling and every once in a while it sprinkles in a king of Judah and then Chronicles is the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. So we're winding down this northern kingdom and they're getting closer and closer to captivity. They are going to go into captivity about 150 years before the Babylonian captivity that the southern kingdom is going to go into and here you have God giving warnings, prophets, that are Elijah and Elijah are, are doing all of this ministry in the northern kingdom. But later on, when it gets close to the cap captivity of southern kingdom, you're going to have Jeremiah and others that are going to be a warning right before the hammer falls. And here you have the northern kingdom that's really not getting it. And they have all these warnings. Tonight, in chapter 8, we're going to see this amazing miracle of, of timing. And uh, we're going to see uh, warnings that are, that are given. And it's, it's important to heed warnings. When we were driving through the Philippines, you know, they got a big anti-drug uh, push that's going on. So they'll have random signs every once in a while. And back in the provinces, I, we came across a couple. I wrote down what the signs said because... It's, here we have, you know, don't do drugs or just say no or something like that. One of their signs was the acronym for DEAD, D-E-A-D, Drugs End All Dreams, is what it said. And another one said, if you do cocaine, you'll go insane. <laughs> that was their drug. That was their sign along the roadside. <coughs> so that gets it in your head. It's like uh, your brain on whatever, frying the egg um, on drugs. It's memorable. All right, so verse 1, 2 Kings chapter 8. Elijah spoke to the woman whose son he had restored to life. That goes back to chapter 4. Remember the Shunammite woman who made this little room for, for Elijah and invited him to stay. And, and uh, after a while... He asked what he could do for her, and she didn't give him any <clears throat> adequate answer. But Gehazi said she doesn't have a child. And so he said, this time next year, you'll have a child. And she had a child that was born. The child grew a little bit, and the child said, my head, my head. And he died. And Elijah was fetched. She went and got him, brought him back, and he laid on the child and did all this stuff. And all of a sudden, the child was restored. So this woman is in this chapter, first account. So Elijah spoke to the woman whose son he had restored to life, <clears throat> saying, Arise and go to your household and sojourn wherever you can sojourn, for the Lord has called for a famine, and it will come on the land for seven years. Remember, Elijah had a drought for three and a half years. Here's a double portion. You got seven years for a famine under Elisha. So the woman arose and did according to the word of the man of God. And she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines for seven years. At the end of seven years, the woman returned from the land of the Phil Philistines. And she sent out to appeal to the king for her house and for her, for her field. So she left for seven years. She came back and her house squatted or something. I don't know. It wasn't available how she, she left her. But anyway, here is this woman who had done all of this stuff and welcomed God's servant, provided a place for him as he was itinerant and he was moving around a lot. And she provided a, a stable place for him. And now he warns her, raises her son from the dead, gives her a son, raises her son, and warns her of a famine, a famine that's coming. Seven years. Remember how bad this famine had gotten when we studied how Samaria was besieged and that they were paying all this money for donkey's heads and dove poop and things like that. And the four uh, 
lepers, probably look like I do right now, those four lepers, they went out and uh, to the camp and found it deserted, but everything was still there. And came back and brought the day of good news and the, and the whole uh, city came out and that one guy was trampled, just like Elijah had said. That was a study we just did. Anyway, she was given this, <coughs> this warning, this warning about a famine for seven years. And here she's set up in a nice home enough that she could incorporate a little room for Elijah, her husband working out in the field. She got this brand new child. And Elijah warns her there's going to be a seven-year famine. Obedience was going to be costly. Her faith was going to cost her seven years of her life, but also she was going to have to walk away from all of her possessions. And she knew this. Seven years. You know, obedience is costly. It demands a lot of us, especially when we are just given the word of God to stand on, the promise of God, and we've got to step out on that. And it seems like, you know what, this could cost. If this doesn't come, to, come true, if there's something wrong with what I'm hearing here, it could be pretty, pretty costly. But the thing about obedience is obedience puts our concerns in God's hands. And all of her situation that she was going to have to walk away, leave vulnerable. She was not leaving it alone. She was placing it in God's hands. And that's what happens when we obey God. We may walk away from something that we feel like we need to guard. Yet we walk away and leave it in, in God's hands. And you think about how different her life would have been if she would have never honored Elijah. Invited him in and provided for him. She never had a son. She uh, would have not have been warned of this famine that was, was coming. And so it would have been very different. If she had not obeyed, her life would have been different as well. If she would have only, you know, seven-year famine, she's going to come back after the seven years. She'd come back after five years, three and a half years, six and a half years. The timing, the miracle of timing we're going to see wouldn't have played out because her obedience was not complete. And we, we can kind of toy with obeying God, kind of like the guy who plants a potato and he digs it up every day to see if it's grown or not. I mean, we can, we, we can play at obedience, and if we're not fully obeying, we're going to mess up some other things that God has set in motion. And so we're going to see a timing that's uh, happening here as well. But she is in the middle of a famine, and there are a whole lot of different famines that people can face, and God's judgment can come in a lot of different ways. In this situation, it's going to be food, a famine for food. There's going to be a famine for water with uh, the drought that happened under Elijah. There, uh, you know, there can be a famine for uh, around the world a lot today. There's a famine for the future. People aren't having children anymore in a lot of different countries. They are under crisis that they will not exist as a people in a century. You know, South Korea is going through this. Japan is going through this. That there may not be Japanese 100 years from now. You know, Japanese is right at the point where they, Japan is right at the point where they are selling, about to sell more adult diapers than baby diapers. That's where they are. They got so many more older people that would need diapers and they've got younger babies that are being, being born. They are under a drought. They're under a famine. We're under a, a famine and, and our, you know, our, our young people aren't having kids anymore. If we didn't have uh, folks coming in from the outside, uh, um, we're not reproducing ourselves. Europe's not reproducing itself. There's a famine. The Bible talks about a famine for the Word of God. There's definitely a famine for morals, for truth. You know, people are living without. They're trying to exist without these things. And so we see famines all around us, and we need to be prepared for them. You know, the Bible warned us of multiple types of famines that, that would happen 
for morals and you know the, in the end times that people would be lovers of self and you know it just warns us continually that we are going to exist in the end times in famines of all different types for the word of God and everything so here she finds herself in a famine but she's been warned of it and she's making preparation and she's choosing to walk in obedience through it now the king Jehoram was talking with Gehazi. Remember Gehazi, the guy that got a little splatter of leprosy when he didn't uh, obey right? He went after the money that uh, Naaman, who had just been healed, had brought for Elijah. And Elijah said, I don't want your stuff. But Gehazi said, you know, I could pick up a little here. And so he chased it down and got some of it. And he ended up not with just the stuff. He got the leprosy as well. Well, here you have the king talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, please relate to me all the great things that Elijah has done. All the great things. You know, there are some people who just, just like the good stuff. Like the good stuff in the Bible. I mean, if we had, we put it on the sign, advertise that we're going to preach through Revelation starting next year. We get a lot of people that... All he wants to hear is the sensational stuff. Or the book of Daniel. Now they'd show up for that. But if you start preaching through Romans or something that really deals with the depth of a man's relationship with God, ah, it's boring. Give me the exciting stuff. You get, you get lost people that will show up just to hear the sensational things. You know, what's the latest and greatest that's happening with uh, prophecy? They show up for that, but they don't have... A smattering of a relationship with God. Or they would hunger and thirst for the deeper things. And here you have this king. He's got Gehazi there. He's kind of like Herod who was wanting to see Jesus so he might see a miracle or two. And he's wanting Gehazi. You know, tell me the good stuff. Tell me all the stuff that Elijah is doing. I mean, you're right there firsthand. You're his servant. You're probably handing him, you know, you're like the magician's assistant. You're handing him the next prop to pull off the next trick. And Elijah's got this great resume going on. He's been, you know, made an axe head float. He, uh, of course, raised this boy from the dead. He fed a, a whole bunch of prophets off a limited amount of food. He blinded a whole army and led them to the king. He predicted this famine that has been horrible you go around and you tell your bedroom secrets to people he predicted that servant was going to get trampled and i'm probably thinking that gehazi's making money okay i'll tell you another story here slip me another 20. it's just his makeup and so who else would be there telling stories probably for money but this king, he's wanting to hear these exciting things. And look what happens. As he was, he was relating to the king how he had restored to life the one who was dead, behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life appeared to the king for her house and for her field. <coughs> she walks in. Right? He's talking about her. He's like... And then there was this boy, he was dead, and this woman, and there she is, right there. That's her. She's walking, there's the kid. That's them, king. Gehazi said, my lord, O king, this is the woman, and this is her son, whom Elijah restored to life. You know, just, you'd like to be a fly on a camel nearby or something, you know, that's just watching this happen. Just the eyes of Gehazi. And the king just, wow, that's her? Coincidence, right? Luck. What a lucky moment that she'd walk in just at that time. You know where the word luck comes from? Lucifer. That's the origin of the word luck. It's not a Bible word. <clears throat> luck is not a Bible thing. Coincidence is not a Bible thing. It's sovereignty. God's control. God's working things out. He is sovereign. And the timing is 
perfect. And she walks in. You know, God knows what he's doing when he's doing things. You know, when Jonah, when he went to preach to the Ninevites, one of the gods of the Ninevites, Dagon, half man, half fish. So what do you think happens when here you have a guy come out of a fish? He says, I've got a message from God. I think that's from our God. We better listen. Not God is sovereign. God knows exactly what he's doing. And just in this right moment, this woman walks in with this need after seven perfect years of staying away. That was exactly what she was told to do. She ends up walking in at the exact right moment. And her story's being told. This woman and her boy walk in. You know, you know Lazarus, I was reading out of the end of John. And something that's amazing to me is that you have <coughs> three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they are in existence for decades. And it's not until John writes, 30, 40 years later, but somebody finally tells us, tells us about Lazarus. One of the most important stories in Scripture. You know, the, I was reading uh, this morning or yesterday morning, the people lined the triumphal entry spot because of Lazarus. Because of his popularity, because he had just been risen from the dead. And everybody wanted to see him. They wanted to see Jesus who had just raised him from the dead. And yet you don't see Lazarus being mentioned until John's gospel. And he was this powerful tool that God had used. And this woman and this child, they came walking in and they were just as impacting to that king as Lazarus was to the people of his day. When the king asked the woman, she related it to him. So the king appointed for her a certain officer saying, restore all that was hers and all the produce of the field from the day that she left her land until now. She got her land back. She walks in at the perfect time. The king, if that's who you are, I want you on my side. He not only restores her land, but all of the produce that's been produced for it, from it for seven years. That's why timing matters. That's why timing matters. That's why you want to be in the center of the bullseye of God's will. Because it matters. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. We want to get this stuff at optimum. We want this stuff working full, full blast. And we want to be in such cooperation with God and his will that he doesn't have to pull back anything. We are just that perfect tool in his hand. So three things you see here. Number one, it's important to, for God to have your ear. It's important for God to have your ear. She was listening to the warnings <clears throat> and she reacted to the warnings and it's important for God to have your will also. She reacted in absolute obedience. The Bible warns us that we're not to get caught like a thief in the night. And if we are listening to God, then we are not going to be caught off guard. And it's important for God to have our ear, to have our will, and it's important for God to have our, our faith, our, control our future, because she waited until the exact timetable. This is what she was told, and this is what she was going to do. Seven years, I'm going to wait seven years, and I'm going to go back. She came back, her stuff's been taken, her house is occupied, next step, Head to the king. Wow. God takes care of it in a miraculous way. All right, second story. Uh, Elijah confronts Haziel. And Elijah, verse 7 says, he came to Damascus. Ben-Hadad, remember Ben-Hadad? Ben-Hadad's this troublemaker, king of Aram. He was sick. And it was told him, saying, the man of God has come here. The king said to Haziel, take a gift in your hand and go and meet the man of God and acquire of the Lord by him saying, will I recover from this sickness? So Haziel went to meet him and he took a gift in his hand. Now, he didn't take this gift in his hand. 
but he took our gift. Even every kind of good thing of Damascus, 40 camel loads. 40 camel loads. You know, Santa, he gets eight reindeer, and he's got this load. He can feed, you know, take care of the whole world with gifts. Here's 40 camels. And he came and stood before him and said, Your son, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, has sent me to you, saying, Will I recover from this sickness? You know, there's nothing that makes you want to find the man of God more than being on your deathbed. Now, where's Ben-Hadad been looking positively? He's looked negatively for Elijah before, but looking for him in a positive way and sending him gifts. He's got to wait till he's dying. When he's dying, he finally sends these 40 camel loads and asks the question, am I going to live? And I'm asking that question right now. Is this sickness going to kill me? Or am I going to want <laughs> I've been asking that. I was asking that on a plane coming by. Am I going to make it? <coughs> All right. Well, 40 camel loads. Naaman had tried to buy Elijah's uh, gifts and responses for his leprosy, but Elijah was not going to be bought off. I told him to keep his stuff. But here you have Haziel representing Ben-Hadad. Elijah said to him, Go and say to him, You will recover. But the Lord has showed me, the Lord has shown me that he will certainly die. It's like a riddle. You're going to recover from your sickness, but you're going to die. And then look what he does. He fixed his gaze steadily on him until he was ashamed. And the man of God wept. And Haziel said, why does my Lord weep? Elijah tells, gives him the answer and says, He's going to recover, but he's going to die. And then he just locks in on him. Puts a stare on him. And the more he looks at him, the more sad he becomes until finally he breaks into tears. And Haziel says, why are you crying? And he answered and said, because I know the evil that you will do to the sons of Israel. Their strongholds will be set on fire. Their young men you will kill with the sword. And their little ones you'll dash in pieces, and their women with child you'll rip up. Haziel, his name means one who sees God. He forgot that God was seeing him as well. God's prophet was looking right into his heart. Remember Jesus at, with the woman at the well? It's all right into her life. Yeah, you don't have a husband. You've had five. The one you're with right now is not your husband. How do you know that? Boom. Eyes of God. Superman eyes for the soul. You know, X-ray eyes. Looking right at him. You know, David and all of his brothers, all of them lining up. Samuel was able to see not just the stature, but he saw the heart. He saw inside. He saw each one of them. Finally, one came along that they had to go fetch that had a Heart after God. One after God's own, own heart. And that was the right one. He saw in David, not just a giant killer, not just a psalmist, but also an adulterer, murderer. I mean, they're all that from God's vantage point. He'd be able to, to see, but also a great repenter. Jesus looked at the rich young ruler and he saw all the right answers were coming. Covetous. Covetous. He saw exactly what the sin problem was. And God can look at our heart and sees who we are. Sees everything about us, both good and bad. And here you have Elijah staring right through to Haziel's soul. And what he saw made him cry. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing. The word of God pierces us. As far as the division of soul and spirit, joint and morals, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. If we could see the potential for evil 
And people who stood before us like that, it scares to death. If we could really see the human heart, Jeremiah said it's more deceitful than anything else, desperately wicked. I don't think I'd want to see what Elijah was seeing as he saw into an actual human soul. And um, you take a long look at the soul of the world, it should make you cry. It should make us weep. If we really see it from God's vantage point and see the depth of what God is seeing. Psalms 139, David says, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any, any hurtful way in me. And lead me in an everlasting way. Hebrews 4.13 there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, we can fool a lot of folks and you know, know the right words and the right behaviors, but God's looking straight through us, straight at our hearts. Haziel said, but what is your servant who is but a dog that he should do such a great thing? Elijah answered, The Lord has shown me that you will be king over Aram. So he departed from Elijah, returned to his master, and said uh, to him, who said to him, What did Elijah say? And he answered, He said that you would recover. Kind of forgot a little bit. Gave him the half, half message. But Haziel seemed surprised <coughs> by the potential that's in his own heart. That this could be possible of him. You know, past Americans would probably be uh, shocked if they saw the potential then, what's come about in our nation now. It would have shocked them back then. They would have wept to think this is in this nation's potential for the future. Look down a little baby, baby Adolf. If his mother could have seen the potential that was gonna come out of that child. I mean, she gave him a middle name. She tried to soften him a little bit. His middle name was Elizabeth. You'd think that would have made him a little more docile, but maybe it was that boy named Sue thing. Yeah. <laughs> made him that much meaner. Yeah. Well, on the following day, he took the cover and dipped it in water and spread it on king's face so that he died and Haziel became king in his place <clears throat> kill a king be a king I guess is the way the rules so recover he didn't recover it's kind of like walking out of a hospital and getting hit by a truck because he recovered but he died he was murdered and I, I'm thinking that when Elijah was looking into his heart and saying he's going to recover Probably number one, Haziel is thinking, oh no, he's going to recover. I was betting on him dying. Now I got to go to plan B because I'm planning on taking over as a king. If he gets well and lives another 10, 20 years, that's going to mess my plan up. So he set in motion an assassination plan probably at that moment that was in his heart was brought to the surface because of this news that made him adjust and dig a little deeper in his, his heart of ugliness and do something he hadn't planned on until the prophet spoke to him. Well, number one, we are rarely the person we think we are. We're rarely the person we think we are. That's why those who stood before, um, who are gonna stand before God, Jesus said that he's gonna say, I never knew you. I never knew you, even though you did all of these things, prophesied, cast out demons, did miracles. I never knew you. They weren't the people they thought they were. We are always the person God knows we are. We're always the person God knows we are. And sometimes it takes the word of God, the law, to, to pierce us and to show us who we are. That's why after Paul said in, in Romans 7, when he had all of that experience with the law and the law, and he... He did the things he didn't want to do and didn't do what he wanted to do. And the law was up against him. After all of that mirror was there, he said, wretched man that I am. 
I thought I was all right, but now God has exposed me as not being okay. We're always the person that God knows we are. And number three, God will judge us by what he knows and not by what we think. He's going to judge us by the books. Either the books that are going to condemn us, that are going to incorporate everything that we did, will be judged by falling short of the law, or we'll be in the Lamb's book, and all of that will be covered by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and we will be in Christ, and we will be made righteous by his righteousness. Now, the end of the chapter, it's just kind of winding down this northern kingdom and getting ready for the last events. It says, In the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, being then the king of Judah, Jehoram, or Joram, they had both have the same names, um, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, became king. He was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. The way you would date people's reigns and kingdoms, you'd kind of point to the other king in his eighth year or whatever, that that's when you started yours. <coughs> Here you have two kings, same name, one in Israel, one in in Judah, same names because there's this, this intermingling between the family of Ahab and this intermarriage that's going on. And so here you have this, this king, son of Ahab, um, and then you've got this king, son of Jehoshaphat, and he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel just as the house of Ahab had done, for the daughter of Ahab had become his wife. He married Ahab and Jezebel's daughters, so why wouldn't he be a turkey, right? He did evil in the sight of the Lord. However, the Lord was not willing to destroy Judah for the sake of David, his servant, since he had promised to give him a lamp through his sons always. So here you have an evil king not getting fully judged because of God's promises to a godly king. He's down the line. But because of some people who existed before him that were right with God, God stays his hand of judgment on those who more than deserve it. How else do you explain what we're seeing in our country? That God hasn't already judged us like Ruth Graham said, he's going to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah if he doesn't judge America because we've become so bad. The only maybe explanation is that there was such a godly start to this nation putting Bible verses everywhere and putting it in our laws and establishing our law around the, the way the Bible directs you to do it, that we spent a lot of years with people like that praying for the future. And now we're kind of riding on their fumes of faith. So the Lord wasn't willing to destroy Judah for the sake of David, his servant. In the days of, in his days, though, he's going to judge him. This is how he judges him. Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah, made a king over themselves. Jehoram crossed over to, uh, to Zair <coughs> and all his chariots with him. And he arose by night and struck the Edomites who had surrounded him and captains of the chariots. But the <coughs> army, his army fled to their tents. So it's like attacking a bear with a you know, stick. Edom's all around him, but he attacks them. And his army runs off. So he loses to Edom. And when he loses to Edom, it says then Libna revolted at the same time. So the rest of the acts of Joram and all that he did, are they not written in the book of Chronicles, kings of Judah? So he became a mess, but he wasn't fully judged because of David. So Joram slept with his fathers. He was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Ahaziah, his son became king in his place in the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, who's still going. Now you got the Jehoram down here who just died, and his son's taken over, but the same Jehoram of Israel is still going. Um, so Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, began his reign. He was 22 years old, and he reigned one year. And here's what you need to hear, because this is going to become important. His mother's name was Athaliah the granddaughter of Omri, Ahab's daddy, the king of Israel. 
He walked in the way of the house of Ahab, did evil in the sight of the Lord, like the house of Ahab had done because he was a son-in-law of the house of Ahab. So he's married to Jezebel and Ahab's daughter, who's uh, <coughs> going to be a stinker here in a little while. She's going to take over, even kill her own grandchildren to become queen herself of Judah when she is out of Israel, out of Ahab and Jezebel's house. Then he went with Joram, the son of Ahab, to war against Haziel. Remember, Haziel is going to become king. He became king of Aram. At Ramoth Gilead, and the Arameans wounded Joram. So King Joram returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Arameans had inflicted on him at Ramah and when he fought against Haziel king of Aram then Ahaziah the son of Jehoram king of Judah went down to see Joram the son of Ahab Jezreel because he was sick <coughs> cozy little situation back and forth it's just like one big family and the end result is you've got these wicked kings of Israel who aren't being influenced by a godly Judah king everybody's becoming wicked that's the way it works out is trying to um, influence outside the grace of God usually ends up with the one who's supposed to be more godly becoming more wicked but basically what you see in these verses is that the northern kingdom's days are numbered and captivity is getting closer, and it's just this rippling effect of the house of Ahab that's getting all of this judgment piled up and piled up. But next week, the good news is Jehu is coming. Jehu is coming. And poor little Jezebel is going to tumble out a window next week after she got all prettied up. She's going to fall out of a window because Jehu is a coming. All right, that is...